uh, start with the first question we have um, from Rebecca. It, uh, the question is, can the speakers talk about anaerobic digestion that can work for meat processing waste, which can include uh, trim, blood, bones, hides, and waste water, wash water? And can this work for that industry? I'll take, or I'll start that, I guess. Um, yes, uh, anaerobic digestion, especially covered lagoons, is used quite frequently already on um, waste from slaughterhouse or for meat processing facilities. And so blood paunch, um, trim, bones and hides, not so much, but wash water, all are, are feedstocks that can either be digested on site at processing facilities or can be co-located and co-digested with, with a product like manure. So they, they are materials that can be digested. Um, you just need to consider management of the fat and nutrients to make sure that the system is healthy because it is a biological system. And, and then maybe I'll just add on, on to that um, from, a, from a revenue standpoint, uh, the, the, the various programs, whether that's the federal program or state programs, uh, look at different feedstocks and, and value different feedstocks differently. So dairy uh, certainly drives the premium uh, and that's just the way California has kind of implemented that. Uh, so there is, there is some delineation between, let's say, a, a food waste or a wastewater or, or animal rendering as opposed to manure uh, or landfill gas, both at the federal and the state level. So it's just something else to, that needs to be considered. Thank you. Uh, the second part of the question is, and this next question are the same. Uh, are there efforts to get smaller scale anaerobic digesters for regions with small scale animal operations? I'll jump in with that. Um, Angstar, we track a number of projects in the United States, like I mentioned earlier. Um, the smallest farm that we have in our database is uh, 25 head of cattle in Vermont. And um, that's made possible because that farm um, also co-digests food waste. And there are a number of incentives specifically in Vermont that support um, that operation. So um, small farms can have systems, um, you know, provided the incentives are there. I think, um, you know, as I mentioned in my presentation and, and the other panelists did as well, um, we're seeing uh, cluster models that can bring together farms of different sizes to co-digest their waste um, or, you know, upgrade the biogas that's produced at a central facility. So we're starting to see that um, take take off across the U.S., um, primarily focused in, in RNG um, generation. And then in AgStar, we're always reaching out to folks. We have strong partners at USDA. Um, we're working with cooperatives across the country to hold discussions with them to see what kind of resources they need. Um, and obviously those folks in those farms and those cooperatives all know each other and are comfortable with each other. So it makes sense to kind of get started at that level um, to see if anaerobic digestion is, is right for some of their facilities. So we're working towards that. Thank you, um, and um, I appreciate that, uh, Vanessa. I, the following question is, uh, what is the cleanup cost? And I think that refers to the, the biogas to the renewable natural gas. Yeah, I can, I can jump in that one. Uh, that's, I guess that, uh, that there is no you know, one, one answer for that. I mean, it, it certainly depends and there's certainly lots of different factors that, that um, Come into play when you try to figure out, you know, both the the capital cost, right? How much is it going to cost for the equipment to actually um, put that in, and then what's the operating cost? So as I, you know, from my presentation, right, there's certainly def different types of, uh, uh, of processes to get that biogas refined into renewable natural gas. Some of them are more capital intensive than others, you know, offset by they have maybe uh, lower or higher operating costs. So certainly that comes into play. Uh, the other things that come into play is, you know, how big is your facility? Uh, are you doing this for 15,000 cows? Or are you doing this for 5,000 cows? There's some, some scalability. Uh, are you building the digesters? You know, some, some uh, farms, as Vanessa mentioned, right, already have existing digesters. So as a developer, we come in and maybe just put in the RNG cleanup uh, facility. Uh, if you're trucking it, that certainly is some incremental cost, not only for the, uh, you know, to, to compress it up, but then also to decompress it. But 
you know, these are this is millions of dollars. Uh, we, you know, we've spent 25, 30 million dollars for for one facility when you're kind of doing everything from digesters to RNG processing to uh, to truck loading and unloading. Uh, I guess the, the next question, maybe I'll, I'll kind of jump ahead, is the injection point Please. for the pipeline cost. Uh, and that one, again, is very interesting, right? There's a, it's kind of sort of the wild west out there in terms of uh, what these things cost to actually inject into a pipeline. Again, uh, we've, we've encountered some, uh, some RNG um, um, opportunities where uh, it's a couple million dollars, uh, proposed a couple million dollars to inject. Uh, we've also had some pipelines that uh, charge, you know, maybe three to four to five hundred thousand dollars. So again, it it literally depends on kind of who you're dealing with, where you are in the country, the volume of gas, uh, a lot of things that kind of come into play. Thank you for that. Yeah, and and a question that was answered directly during the presentation relates to the concentration of oxygen, and a lot of these vary state to state as well. So similarly, that's um, yes. depends on where you are. The following question uh, relates to the. Uh, I think your presentation, Kevin, whether you've already worked uh, in injection already, or is it still planning in construction phase? No, we have seven, uh, we have 11 operating uh, RNG facilities, four are based on landfills, and seven uh, facilities today up and running that are um, based on dairy biogas. Perfect, thank you. Um, uh, the following question, uh, you touched on that, Dana, during your presentation, are you having to heat the digester in the winter, Wisconsin, Michigan, to experience Temperature yeah. Is 32. So, yeah. so you do need to plan for heating. Um, I mean, we have good insulation and good heating on our digester on campus, and we still drop to about 94 degrees. Our normal target was 104 degrees Fahrenheit. So, you do need to accommodate and, and provide heating for these systems. Um, there are significant decreases in gas production um, at around 90 degrees, and then even bigger decreases in gas production once you drop below 70 degrees Fahrenheit. So, Winter, winter accommodations are important. Um, the manure coming out of barns is generally gonna be above freezing temperature because of the insulation or the, the wind protection in the barn as well as the body heat of the animals. So we might experience frozen manure for one to three weeks in Michigan, but um, for the most time, most of the part, most of the year we can get the manure out of the barn and into the digesters and, and then warm it there. Thank you. Uh, the next question is, uh, from an economic and operational standpoint, are complete mixed tanks significantly better than covered lagoons? I have a biased opinion on it, but yes. <laughs> I mean, they are more expensive. Um, actually, I just we, I just had a grad student finish yesterday, so we've got some, some information coming out. Um, there are productivity improvements. Um, you get more gas out of a CSTR or a, a heated and insulated in mixed system than you would a covered lagoon. And you also get more stable gas production 365 days of the year. Um, but there's trade-offs. I mean, they are more expensive. And so it's it's really a valuation that says, is it worth the extra cost to, to get the consistency in the higher gas production versus more seasonal production and, and a lower gas production overall? Absolutely. And, and you made that point, depending on the type of manure and the consistency, it might not be an option relying on one or the other. So. Um... Thank you. Yeah, we have a diagram in our project development handbook that lays out, you know, what type of system you have on your farm. Is it a flush or a scrape? And then typically the types of systems that will be used um, for that percent solids. Perfect. Thank you, Vanessa. Uh, the next question is, um, is development occurring for solid manure use in anaerobic digestion? Um, I, I think closer to the solid state where it's not diluted with, uh, with water or uh, separated solids. Yeah, there's um there's some systems that are called high solids anaerobic digesters um, where you can stack the manure um, and then the sort of uh, sealed unit is evacuated oxygen. Um, you know, they're not as common. I, I think there's fewer than five in the U.S. and and that was at the time of the publication of our project development handbook. So. Um, we have some information about um, those devices in that uh, resource. Excellent. Uh, the next question, uh, when, uh, when compared to raw manure applied to cropland, how does anaerobic digestion changes the form of crop nutrients? So I'll take that. Um, when you go through anaerobic digestion, you are converting nutrients that are tied up in plant material or organic material in releasing them to be back in their inorganic form. And so you might see um, 
you should see an improvement in nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium avail availability in first year applications. So uh, I think it's about a 50% uh, of the nutrients of nitrogen and phosphorus will end up in an organic form as opposed to, or I'm sorry, inorganic form. Um, whereas maybe with raw manure, only 25% to 30% are in the inorganic form. Excellent, thank you. Um, the following question is what percent of the fiber solids are lost during the digestion or how does it affect the fiber portion that can be used as bedding post digestion? I can start, I guess. Um, sure. When we look at the amount of total solids, volatile solids that are converted, we're only actually ever moving about half of the organic matter to make 30% to 50% of the organic matter is converted into methane and carbon dioxide. And so we have 50 to 70% still of the carbon remaining in the manure. So there are still lots of solids available for, um, for fiber in the, in the digestate or for bedding. The question about bedding, um, as you start to reuse manure fiber over and over, um, there are some changes that you're gonna see and, and the material that's actually remaining is very, very structurally tough. I mean, it's lignocellulose and it's the structural material of plant walls. And so it doesn't break down in digestion um, very well. And it's going to go through the system numerous times. And probably most of the breakdown of that material actually is caused by the mechanical shearing and things that happen while you're pumping it and, and moving it. But um, I, don't know of a, I don't know of a dairy farm with a digester that is not satisfied with the volume of fiber on the backside for bedding. I think in most cases, there's no concern about the amount of fiber for bedding. Great, thank you. And uh, our last question is, compared to using biogas to generate electricity on farm, would you say one of the benefits driving this, uh, the biogas to RNG pipeline, um, uh, that it relieves the farm of the cost and the hassle of running a generator, sort of out of sight, out of mind? Yeah, I can take that one. Um... It depends, right? I mean, certainly uh, an RNG facility on the dairy farm is, is certainly a lot more technically complex than, a, uh, than an on-site generation, electricity generation. So uh, why typically some farms would be able to, to kind of own and operate an electricity generator, I think um, the, the, the science and this, the, the sheer amount of capital investment and, and technology know-how probably precludes a lot of farms from doing that. So they uh, look for companies like ours or other companies to come in and, and do that. So from that starting point, maybe it is a lot easier for uh, for a farm to you know not have to worry ab about that. Uh, I guess maybe, you know kind of taking a step up, right? These are more like I mentioned; these are more complex. These are um, more capital intensive, and it actually is you know um, going back to scalability, right? It, it's a lot harder to do an RNG project on a small farm as opposed to electric generation. So electric generation still would allow uh, some beneficial use. Uh, from a small from a small project or from a small farm if, if RNG isn't uh, applicable but certainly yeah certainly it would uh, allow, allow a farm to kind of concentrate on the on the dairy portion and not necessarily the 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 energy portion of a project that makes sense thank you Kevin um, yeah again I want to uh, turn and thank all our presenters today uh, for for the wealth of information and the answers they provided